All right, next we'll uh, move towards uh, that operation that everybody loves when they're doing that bad, nasty gallbladder and you get down and you're peeling off and you see a lovely hole in the calm bile duct. If that happens to me, there's one person I call as one of my colleagues, Dr. Watson. Thank you, Dr. Cripps. Thank you for asking me. And uh, we are working at the same place. It's a little place called Parkland Hospital. And uh, I'm mostly a minimally based surgeon, surgeon, but I do do a day, a month of trauma call. And so I think that covering this topic, I think, is extremely important because uh, we do five gallbladders a day at Parkland every day. And so there are literally thousands of gallbladders that are done. The vast majority of them are done by our acute care surgeons. They're not done by the minimally evasive or the hepatobiliary surgeons. They're done by the acute care surgeons. So, you know, this is very important and germane to what we're talking about. Um, we'll start with a case presentation. Uh, I just look back at what the last time I saw one of these was. And I was, of course, on trauma call. It was Saturday night at Parkland, maybe 10 or 11 at night. And we were doing the fifth gallbladder that day. And uh, it was in a 56-year-old gentleman uh, who'd been having pain for four, four months. He had tenderness without peritonitis. A sonogram showed a col col uh, gallstones and a small common duct. Had a white count of 14 and a bilirubin of 2.5. So you'd say, well, why don't we do an ERCP first? That's not what we do here. Um, because my job is to do selective cholangiography. I only do a cholangiogram when I'm taking out the gallbladder. <laughs> so I have to, my job is to show everyone how to do a cholangiogram. So these people that have a bilirubin of two and a half, they're the ones that I like to take to the operating room because they may have a stone that I can get out and uh, save the person in the ERCP completely. Um, so we took this patient to the operating room and put the laparoscope in and immediately saw explosions underneath the gallbladder. Just. Uh, big wad of inflammatory tissue into the gallbladder. We got the ports in, got the, the, uh, the surgeon's uh, port that uses to pull the fundus up, which I was holding, and of course I grabbed the neck of the gallbladder and pulled it, and of course it tore. And as it tore, a big gallstone fell out. And after the gallstone fell out, we removed it and washed it out inside the gallbladder and put the scope in, and we could see the hepatic bifurcation it was connected to the gallbladder, so we were sort of done. Um, so at that point, uh, we, we, we saw this picture, which was lovely, and then we converted to open surgery. Okay. The base of the gallbladder is connected to the uh, common duct. It was a, a centimeter or so from the bifurcation. The gallbladder was closed. The di distal duct, we, clo uh, we moved the gallbladder to close the distal duct and then did a Ruy hepatic ojuginostomy. I was working with one of our one of our early, uh, especially residents who was going into vascular, and so him and I put this thing together pretty easily. Um, did the RUI postoperatively, the patient did fine. His bowel function returned, started to return in about four days. We started on diet, and he did get a superficial wound infection, which we treated with uh, open dressing changes. Had a blank drain in that was a little tinged, and then once he started his diet, cleared up, so we removed that. Uh, checked the pathology, pathology came back, uh, chronic inflammation, no evidence of uh, malignancy, and he was discharged in post-op day 10. Um, we saw him two weeks in the clinic, two weeks post-op, uh, but then he was lost to follow-up. And uh, a lot of these uh, people with this problem are in just that category. He had uh, type 2 uh, Maritzi syndrome, okay. not common. Um, but this is something that you can see, and uh, so the question is, who's Maritzi? Well, uh oh, forgive me. Maritzi was this uh, dashing young surgeon that, that was born in Argentina of uh, Italian uh, immigrant parents. And Maritzi studied early, he was on faculty early, and even though his name is applied to the syndrome, he is actually in the field um, more famous for the fact that he did the first interoperative cholangiogram in the 30s. There it is. So Ritzy did the first operative cholangiogram and then he described, go back. Now we're just trying to take a picture of something. 
can't get back to it. I think you have to back this one as well. It doesn't back, it doesn't do it. This one? Yeah. Yeah, no, I really screwed it up. There we go. Can you get a picture of that? Let's put your Maritzi. Sorry. So Maritzi uh, described this uh, syndrome in night. He published it in 1940, and he said it was a rare cause of hepatic duct obstruction from a stone that was actually in the gallbladder. And at the time, when he published this, he reported two types. The two Maritzi types were type one, which was outside compression of the hepatic duct from a stone inside the gallbladder, and type two is when there's actual erosion of the gallstone into the common bile duct. Um, and I said that. This remains sort of the standard uh, uh, categorization of this syndrome until uh, Sendus in, in 1989 uh, further stratified it. And he created a new category where there were four category, categories because he's, he stratified the second type of Maritzi syndrome into three different varieties. Uh, first, of course, was extrinsic compression of the hepatic duct from the gallbladder. The second type had a one third of the circumference of the bile duct was involved with the gallstone, two thirds in type three, and, and type four was an entire uh, common, bu common bile duct was affected. This remained until about 2008, which, when again he published uh, the, the idea that there is actually type five, and type five included not only the Maritzi uh, two, three, four but also included a cholecystoenteric fistula, okay, which can lead to um, gallstone pancreatitis. And I'm sorry, gallstone, uh, uh, gallstone ileus. This uh, was modified again in 2012 that Beltrain from Chile um, wanted to simplify the stratification, and so he did three uh, types. The type one was, again, external compression. Type two was the... Uh, cholecystofistula, cholecystobiliary fistula, and type three is including the uh, uh, cholecystoenteric fistula either with or without uh, gallstone ileus. Gallstone ileus. And just of a note with this, anyone that's seen this, um, these are typically patients that are 80 years old and really sick and have a bowel obstruction. And so when you get into the operating room, doing advanced hepatobiliary surgery is, is not probably your primary issue. Taking out the, uh, the big gallstone from the terminal ileum is, and so you usually have to do this in a staged uh, fashion. A paper came out uh, from USC last year, actually, which published the largest series of Maritzis uh, that has been published so far. And in a six-year period, they found, they found 60 cases out of the almost 5,000 gallbladders that they had done at USC. And uh, what they found in their presenting symptoms was that 100% of them had abdominal pain. Uh, a lot of them had nausea, vomiting. 40% had jaundice, and a third had uh, cholangitis. Uh, laboratory presentation was similar to the guy we had. His uh, AST, AL, ALT, or elevated. His bilirubin is elevated. Um, and the white blood, count, blood, white blood cell count is actually normal in their series. Um, in terms of preoperative diagnosis of this, this is what they found. I think this is useful for understanding what you're up against here. Um, they were able to preoperatively diagnose of the 60 patients, preoperatively they had Maritzi syndrome in 43 of them, or 70%. Ultrasound was only effective at binding this in about 13% of, of patients. Um, they usually found that there could be a bile duct stone in half of them. Um, the diagnosis of Maritzi's was ERCP was about 58% accurate, not 100%. MRCP was the most accurate of all their findings. Um, ERC has, ERCP has the obvious advantage over MRCP is that ERCP can be therapeutic as well as diagnostic as well. Um, and the CT findings were about a third, so it's not the best study for it. So in the USC paper, they went back to Maritzi's idea of two types. And so the two types were type one, which was external compression, and type two was uh, an actual fistula. So in their group of 60, 16 of them had the type one or external compression. 
of the hepatic duct. Uh, what they found is that they attempted, in those 16 patients, on eight of them, they tried, attempted to do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, but were only successful in half of those. The conversion rate was high. And so the number of people that actually were able to have a laparoscopic surgery to take care of this was, was a small number. And this is in the type 1. Um, the way they managed the cystic duct, or the remnant of whatever was left, is they use uh, stapling, a suturing, a 9, staple ligation, surgical clips, uh, endo loops, and T2 placement. And one of them had an immediate bile duct injury, which was repaired with the RUI. Their next group, the type 2, were 44 of the 60 patients. And of those, they attempted laparoscopy in nine. And of those nine patients, they converted eight of them to open. So the number of successful uh, laparoscopic cases with uh, type 2 meritsis was, was very small. Um, there was, the way they managed it was with uh, primary closure of the duct, uh, you know, a, a very few. Uh, primary closure with T2 placement, uh, hepaticojujinostomy in most of them, and then use of the gallbladder wall to close your, your, your defect, either with or without a T2. Uh, complication rates are, are as they listed. Uh, the most common was uh, uh, wound deflection, bio leak, and reoperation. So their conclusion in this, in this study, and this again this is the largest uh, collection that, that's been in the literature, the conclusion is that it may be technical, technically possible to do uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy in someone that has a Maritzi syndrome, but there is good literature to support the fact that you're going to have a higher morbidity, mortality, and conversion rate if you try to do it laparoscopically. So you have to highly select the patients that you're going to want to go in and try to do this laparoscopically initially. There's, again, never harm, or usually not harm, in you putting the scope in and taking a look, um, but a lot of times that's the experience. The other thing they found in the study was that they had, of the 60 patients, three of them had gallbladder cancer, which gives a rate of 5% of cancer, which is extremely high since the overall risk of people with gallstones is between uh, 0.13 and 1.5%. So this is at least five times or greater. The chance of you having gallbladder cancer may be in one of these Maritzi's patients. So, one of my thoughts in talking with acute care surgeons like Dr. Cripps is that gallbladder disease and gallstones, uh, biliary colic, are generally benign conditions, okay? People, of course, can die, but they're generally benign condition, uh, whereas a common bile duct injury can be a lethal event. Therefore, we have to focus our, our efforts when we're doing this on prevention of a common bile duct injury. <clears throat> this report came out last year from New York. Uh, where they used their research co cooperative si system to look at uh, the uh, bile duct injuries from 2005 to 2010. They found of all their lap coles, which was 156,000, they had 125 uh, patients with a common bile duct injury. This, of course, is 0.08 with, uh, percent, which is much lower than the, the average. The surgery that was used to repair these common bile duct injuries is listed. Uh, a quarter of them underwent a hepatectomy uh, to remove that portion of the liver. Um, the hepaticojejunostomy was the most common repair for it. Some went uh, primary repair of the bile duct as well. And then, uh, you know, a, a number of them went over complex multiple procedures. What they found in summary was that people that had sustained a common bile duct injury, their mortality rate during the period of the study was 20%. That's 20% mortality. Whereas if you look at the age-adjusted death rate in this group of people that have gallstones, it's uh, 700 per 100,000. So it's a very small rate. So this is significant. Um, the number of the mortality involved with having a common, common bile duct injury is, is significant. And we need to avoid that. So what then? What if we can't achieve the critical view of safety? Um, a paper came out uh, by Strasburg. Uh, Brunt and Pucci last year, and this uh, this was talking about if you can't get your critical view, what are your backup plans? What are you going to do differently? And uh, what Strasburg quoted in saying this was that if the critical view of safety cannot be um, identified, but there has to be an effective method of dealing with the difficult gallbladder, and it must include a safe and effective bailout technique 
when you can't achieve uh, critical view. So just to go over quick critical view, everyone knows critical view. Uh, it's it, clearing off the hepatocystic triangle, uh, getting visualization of the liver behind uh, your triangle. Uh, and it involves the cystic duct, the cystic plate, the connection of the gallbladder, and the only one structure in between is going to be the cystic artery. One thing I just wanted to point out is that the, the most difficult portion of clearing the critical view of safety is getting that, that view where you can see the actual cystic plate at the bottom of the gallbladder. I think this is extremely important because the common bile duct does not enter above the cystic plate. I mean, biliary anatomy is the most variable in the body, but the common bile duct generally doesn't enter in above the cystic plate. So if you have to identify the cystic plate um, before you know that you have a critical view of safety, it's, it's extremely important. So what are the ideas that Strasburg had about the bailout if this is, uh, you can't get a critical view of safety and you're just not able to do it without injuring something, what else can you do? Um, well, the idea is, well, you don't take out all the gallbladder, you do a subtotal or you take it partial. And so they went into the, the idea of defining between subtotal and partial. And uh, they preferred using the subtotal terminology because partial doesn't really clarify exactly how much of the gallbladder you're trying to take out. Uh, more importantly is, with all this is what are you going to do with the remnant or what's remaining of the gallbladder after you do your full cystectomy? So there's two general ways you can take care of it. One is you close the remaining gallbladder, and the other is just to fenestrate it or keep, leave it open. Um, Strasburg and company uh, said that probably the best way to approach this is going to be to uh, do a fenestrating, not a reconstituting uh, closure, because the reconstituting, you're going to get gallbladder remnant and it's known that these things could, could become symptomatic uh, quickly or later on and have to require a new procedure to take care of uh, that, that remnant. So therefore, they're really proposing that fenestrated uh, 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 subtotal cholecystectomy is the way to handle the, uh, where you don't want to approach the hilum at all. Uh, this is a diagram from the fenestrated. It also shows, it, this is a nice diagram because it shows the uh, shield of uh, McElnoll, which is the rim of the gallbladder at the very bottom before you get to the cystic duct. And that, that can be a helpful sign because you're going to be you're taking off this part of the gallbladder wall and you're going to get down to that shield of McElnoy and, and it's, it's a protection to prevent you from doing further. Now, the Achilles heel, the problem with doing a fenestrated is that you're leaving this open and so you, you are going to potentially have an open cystic duct that could leak. Okay, so it is possible uh, to go in and put sutures to close that from the interior source of the surface of the gallbladder to suture close the cystic duct from the outside. I found this to be nearly impossible. Um, it looks great on pictures like this, um, but when all the inflammation around that area, it's very difficult to do that. So what do you do then? Well, you can do a lot of things, but these generally close. The bile duct uh, leaks generally close from the cystic duct. And I think it can be greatly facilitated by having your uh, gastro uh, gastrointestinal colleagues go ahead and put a stent in the common bile duct. It'll decrease the pressure. So how else can you stay out of trouble? Well, the critical view of safety is our gold standard for, uh, to make sure that it's safe to approach. But there's other couple of things I just wanted to go over that, that can be helpful. Uh, Robier sulcus. Uh, was described in 2005, and what that is is it's a cleft between uh, the left, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, the right segment of the liver and the caudate lobe. There's a sulcus there, which we'll show you, which we see in about 80 or 90 percent of the patients. And this can be helpful because it gives you a sign of where the the uh, portal plate is going to be and where your hilum is going to be located, and so it can direct you to a place that's more safe. So. The Rovier sulcus is that little cleft that's on there, and everything below there potentially could be part of your uh, hilar plate. So therefore, you need to avoid things in general that are below your Rovier uh, sulcus. There's another picture of it as well. That little cleft that you see when you're, when you're doing a lap colon is called Rovier sulcus. And you can show that the little line there shows that everything, the hilar plate is going to be below uh, the Rovier sulcus. Uh, uh, the other thing uh, 
that's interesting is the falciform ligament does not direct or point to uh, the portal triad. Uh, the falciform ligament is actually between segment three and four, and the portal triad is between is between four and five, and so. Therefore, you don't want to use the falciform as an excellent judge to keep you out of trouble because it's in a different location. It's, it's lateral of where the falciform lig ligament is. So, fail-safe options. How do you escape? Um, well, subtotal colectomy is uh, a, a viable and, and uh, a good alternative for taking care of it. Um, you could consider, if you get in there and it just looks terrible, I did, actually did this a, a couple months ago, that just took the camera out and said, well, we'll come back another day. Um, it's acceptable if you're doing this laparoscopically, you take the camera out and start antibiotics and you know you can reapproach this again in, in several months and you might have better success. Uh, you can place a drain or cholecystostomy tube in the gallbladder and that's avoiding you getting in the hyalur structures uh, whatsoever. And then another is to ask for another set of hands or, or eyes and hands in the operating room to help you with taking a look at all this. What if you do encounter a duct injury? So how do you know that? Well, you are doing your hyalur dissection, all of a sudden you see a rush of bilirious fluid that's not coming from the gallbladder, and you think, oh gosh, I've got a common duct injury. Um, I think there's things that are advisable when this occurs. Uh, one is to ha ask for help, okay? There's gonna be somebody else in the operating room that can come and take a look at this, hopefully. And because you are far too tachycardic to be taking care of this in a rational fashion, um, I think having help is important. You need to assess the expertise in your hospital of taking care of this. We have to know that the best outcome for repairing common duct injuries is the time of that surgery. However, it's also shown that the overwhelming uh, preponderance of good success is done with patients or physicians that have expertise in biliary reconstruction. So you have to find, you have to assess what your uh, what your experience level at the hospital is. If you think you have a common duct injury, converting to open surgery is not a good idea for in terms of a diagnosis. You should convert to open surgery if you're having trouble with bleeding or some other practical problem. Uh, but just doing a laparotomy to prove that you have a common duct injury actually helps or actually hurts the person that's eventually going to go in and reconstruct this. So it's much better for you to place a drain, transfer, if you're not sure, place a drain and then check an ERCP. It may be that you're actually just looking at the cystic duct and you're fine. Then you can take it back and work on the gallbladder after that. Um, but doing a laparotomy for uh, proving that it's a common duct injury is, is not a great idea. Questions? 